He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora and welcome to Elemental from RNZ, a chemical jaunt around the periodic table of elements. I'm Alison Balance. And I'm Alan Blackman from the Auckland University of Technology. And in episode 81, we are talking about technetium. Oh, hold on. At the end of the last episode, I said technetium because that's what it looks like when you spell it. (laughs) Indeed, and I was going to correct you, but I didn't. But seeing as it's the next episode, technetium it is. (laughs) <laughs> Even though it's got a T-I-U-M at the end. Okay. Even though it's got a T-I-U-M at the end, yes. I, as you were. <laughs> <laughs> so what's so cool about technetium? It was, in fact, the first element on the periodic table to be synthesized. And that's where it, in fact, got its name from. Technetium comes from the Greek technetos, meaning artificial. Wasn't it one of Mendeleev's long predicted elements that he thought should be on the periodic table and... When did we first make it? Indeed it was. So good old Mendeleev predicted some of the properties of element 43, as he did with uh, many other elements that had yet to be discovered. But technetium, or element 43 as it was known, I guess, remained stubbornly undiscovered until the year 1937, leaving a conspicuous hole right in the middle of the periodic table. I bet that annoyed chemists. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) This is looking very untidy. There's a hole in the middle. (laughs) And um, that hole was eventually filled by the element that came to be known as technetium. So the vital statistics of this, the chemical symbol TC, the atomic number 43, as I said, Mm. goes bang in the middle of the periodic table, and it's a radioactive element. And therein lies the reason that it actually remained undiscovered, because it doesn't really exist on planet Earth. Now, having said something absolute like that, it is present, but in very, 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 very tiny amounts. So to all intents and purposes, it really doesn't occur naturally. And the reason for that is the same as what we found for promethium. All of its isotopes are, in fact, radioactive, And so any technetium that was originally present when the Earth was formed will have long since decayed away. And the reason for this is the longest lived isotope of technetium has a half-life of around about 4.2 million years. And so all of it will have decayed away after around about 50-odd million years, which in terms of uh, the uh, age of the Earth is peanuts pretty much. So technetium's great claim to fame, as we've already said, was it was the first chemical element to be made by humanity. But, as is often the case, there were a few false starts on the way to this great achievement. And if you go back to the rhenium episode, this is important because both rhenium and technetium are in group seven of the periodic table. And you remember that a guy by the name of Masataka Ogawa was trying to actually find technetium. And he reckoned he had it in the year 1908, and he called it Neponium after Japan. But in fact, when his notes were re-looked at in 2004, people figured out that he had actually isolated rhenium. And so then, when rhenium was obtained by Ida Tucker, Walter Nodak, and Otto Berg in 1925, its discoverers also claimed to have isolated element 43 in addition to this. And they then called it Mazurium. Um, But their claim was correctly discounted. And so it was eventually obtained by uh, a couple of Italian guys, Emilio Segre and Carlo Perrier, in Palermo, Sicily, in the year 1937, through rather circuitous means. (laughs) It's it's not even a lanthanoid, and uh, it took a lot of getting this. At least you used the word circuitous, not the word tortuous. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. Only lanthanides are tortuous, indeed. Yes, yes. (laughs) So we go to Sicily in the mid-1930s, and it's fair to say that Sicily wasn't exactly at the forefront of science at that particular time. So how did this incredibly groundbreaking discovery come to be made in really what was a scientific backwater? And the answer lies in, I guess, one of the people who discovered it. Uh, So this guy, Emilio Segre, uh, had worked with uh, the very, very famous physicist Enrico Fermi, who was Italian, And Segre visited Berkeley in 1936, and he persuaded a guy by the name of E.O. Lawrence, 
some listeners might know that name as being familiar. Uh, Lawrence won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1939 for the development of a thing called the cyclotron. And he persuaded this guy Lawrence to give him worn out and broken parts from this cyclotron uh, because he might be able to use them back in Palermo as radioactive sources. And for those of you who don't know, a cyclotron is just basically a piece of apparatus that accelerates particles to very, 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 very high speeds and energies. So Lawrence was sending uh, Segre these bits of brass and copper plates from the cyclotron, and they had become radioactive because of the fact that they had been used in the cyclotron. But in early 1937, Segre was sent a molybdenum plate that had been bombarded by deuterons for quite a while in the cyclotron. And long story short, chemical analysis of the molybdenum plate allowed isolation of a tiny amount of element 43. And this was pretty big news. And so following confirmation of this result by others, in 1947 the name technetium was proposed by Segre and Perrier as the original discoverers of this new artificial element. So it's got a pretty typical number of chemical disadvantages, I'd have to say. It's radioactive, it's rare, Mm -hmm. so does it have any uses? Well, uh, of course, being radioactive, you might expect that the element, yeah, it's not going to have a lot of uses. But surprisingly, and this is what you might not expect, it is in fact very important in medicine, of all things, as there is an isotope of technetium, and this is technetium 99M. M, M, what does that stand for? Oh, I was hoping you'd ask. (laughs) Please explain. The M stands for metastable. Okay, so that means it's kind of sort of stable, but not overly. So this is a very, very special uh, technetium isotope. And it's very, very useful in, in fact, diagnostic medical imaging. It's got just the right uh, energy and it's got just the right half-life to give you very good pictures of your insides. So very, very useful there. Here's an ironic use, I guess, of uh, technetium. One of the best ways of rendering steel impervious to rusting is to add a tiny amount, and when we're talking tiny amount, we're talking tens of parts per million, of a compound called potassium pertechnetate, KTCO4. And that's brilliant. It'll stop your steel rusting. Unfortunately, of course, it also makes your steel radioactive. (laughs) Just kind of pointless, <laughs> if you don't mind me saying so. Well, as long as you don't go near the steel, it's fine. <laughs> and, and that's it for technetium? Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's pretty much it, except for the fact that there are some red giant stars. So they are of the spectral types S uh, and M and N, And these all contain a spectral absorption line indicating the presence of technetium. And apparently these red giants are known informally as technetium stars. Pretty cool. That's nice. Well, (laughs) that's it for the first synthetic element. That's pretty significant, though. Another (laughs) chemical record holder. Thank you, Alan, for that. And you can find out more at our webpage, rnz.co.nz forward slash chemistry, and find plenty of other episodes where you found this one. We're back next time with Tellurium, is that right? Yes, indeed. Cool. <laughs> but until then, it's goodbye from me, Alison Balance. And me, Alan Blackman. Mate <laughs> wa.